I do want to ask though, because you mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, this idea of short-term thinking and planning versus long-term thinking and planning. And I feel like we are in a very short attention span, short-termism um, way of looking at things and dealing with problems. Um, and migration is one of them. And that uh, in, in a certain sense, migration has been weaponized by politicians, um, you know, the latest uh, that concerns me, for example, is what Poland is doing with migrants at the border um, that are coming in through Belarus, um, sending them back, uh, flouting EU and UN uh, conventions, um, you know, and, and many states in Europe, you know, are not very friendly towards migrants or refugees. Um, um, is there, you know, so there's that, the weaponization of migration and, and when you look at migration, is it also refugees or is it pure economic migration? Yeah, you know, and, and uh, the, look, let's remember that particularly in the 20th century, the majority of migration was economic. And I say that despite the fact that the 20th century was also the century of world wars, genocides and expulsions. And despite those numbers that we know from World War I and World War II and the interwar period, the late 20th century economic migration massively dwarfs that, right? It was tens of millions of people, um, you know, crisscrossing the world in, in, in search of economic opportunities. So the, the Latin American population and Asian populations rising in the night from the 1960s onward in the United States because of the Immigration Reform Act. Um, and of course, the guest workers coming into Europe from Turkey and elsewhere are just, just several examples uh, of that. So we are a species of economic economic migrants, if you will, in terms of recent history. Now, at the political level, of course, you continue to have political refugees and the weaponization of migration. And those instances number still in the single digit millions. Now, that's significant and it's tragic. Um, but in the grand scheme of things, when I categorize these, let's remember that in this century, climate migrants already outnumber political migrants and economic migrants, right? So we, I do take them as a totality, but in each region, each constellation that we look at, the composition uh, of, of, the, of the movement of people is gonna be different. Um, you know, in some cases, it's gonna be more economic than environmental or political. In other cases, it's gonna be more political. So I do think when it comes to refugee flows and this weaponization phenomenon, of course, this is where the Mediterranean region uh, Turkey, and now Eastern Europe when it comes to what's happening between Belarus and Lithuania and so forth, those kinds of situations uh, uh, come into play. And we have these, again, you know, incredibly tragic situations. Uh, also, obviously, one has to mention what uh, Spain and Italy and Greece are, uh, and France are doing in terms of dealing with militias to prevent migrant flows across the Mediterranean. I think this is all obviously terrible also from not, not only in the, from the humanitarian standpoint, and the fact that you know lives are being played with in this way and exploited. But when you look at the demographic, when you look at the labor shortages in these economies, right, they could actually do with a lot more workers in those societies. Now, of course, these would be unassimilated migrants and it would be extremely difficult. But when I, you know, sort of, and I again I have nothing but humane reactions to the situation, but at the same time, you can also step back and say, if you look at it technocratically, you would say, wait, Greece has labor shortages in agriculture, you know, so does Italy. Um, they could really use these people. Why can't we find a way for them to, you know, grapple pragmatically? And this is a legal question, and I talk about this in the book. We're in uncharted territory because right now. In European political systems, they're having these d debates about sending back asylum seekers and refugees to Syria, because you know, in some court, in some justice systems, they're deemed that Syria is sort of stable-ish enough-ish, so you can put people on a plane. And the Syrians are, of course, saying, "No, please don't send me back. This is, you know, you're basically signing my death sentence." But they are being put on planes and sent back, and Sweden and other countries are doing this. Now, I want you to apply the same logic to a climate scenario, mm. right? And we don't have a precedent for this. Can you send a climate refugee back to Eritrea or some country that's, you know, has no more water? Can you really do that in good conscience or otherwise? No. So, you know, these are some of the issues that I'm grappling with. And, and so the weaponization issue that we're talking about right now is one issue, but it's not the only one. And we have to treat them each in their kind of, you know, in their particular situation. Mm -hmm.